For our viewers abroad, bonjour, welcome, and howdy. In today's video, we're going to be looking at this, and this is the AA-52. It's a French light machine gun that was designed in, well, you guessed it, 1952, and was within use with the French army all the way between the, the, the early 50s right through to potentially the current date. You might see these on top of some uh, current armoured cars, and you may see them coaxially mounted in some of the larger bits of armour. So, to brief you before we start, this is a deactivated weapon. So, this weapon cannot be loaded, but we will still go through some very basic safety checks to ensure no one has swapped this for a live one whilst we've been talking. So, very quickly, I'm going to remove or lift the top cover, and there's another feed, and I'm looking down inside. Inside of here is the top of the bolt. I still cannot tell if this weapon is loaded, so I'm going to pull the weapon to the rear. Now, one of the great design features with this gun is the fact that if this stock, this skeleton stock, is folded inwards, it holds the bolt in the closed position. Got a fiddly little catch in the back here, to be honest. Okay, so the stock is now out. That means that the bolt is now free. So I'm lifting the feed tray, I'm cocking the gun to the rear, and I can see inside that this is clear. So I say, clear. We're looking like we're good to go. Feed tray down, cover back on, and I'm going to ease the mechanism forward. Across with the safety, and fire. As I said, we're just going to focus in, what is this gun? What are the constituent parts? And then we'll look at this and the mounting on the M53 Hotchkiss M201G. We also might have a look at the sustained fire setup or configuration for this, so we'll, we'll have a look at that as well. And that uses the Browning, the uh, model uh, 1919 Browning tripod. So we'll, we'll see how these fit uh, on top of that. Okay, so we're gonna start now, we're gonna bring the camera in and we'll start having a closer look at these different parts of the weapon. We have the weapon laid out here. This is the uh, skeletal rear stock that slides in and out that you saw slightly earlier. On the very end, I would describe this as a shoulder brace that goes over the top of the shoulder when firing. We now have this here, which is the singular rear bipod. This is to elevate the rear part of the gun, and this was really stolen from the FM24. Now we've got one of those weapons here, we'll get that up onto the table in the minute, and we'll compare and contrast the, uh, the layout of these two weapons. So here we have the rear bipod. We go into the trigger mechanism here with the pistol grip, and up the top here we have the top cover. Now those of you who are uh, keen uh, weapon enthusiasts or collectors will note that this looks very, very similar to the German M series of machine gun. So one could possibly suggest that this was copied from them, uh, but certainly it is very reminiscent. This entire unit here actually is very easy to remove, and that's done, uh, it's removed for when this weapon goes inside of armoured cars and tanks, as it's actually fired by an electronic device rather than the trigger. This here, corresponds all the way to the end of the barrel where we've got a flip up over here. We have a flip up front or foresight and there's a small dab of paint in there so this can be fired uh, when the light is starting to go. Back to the middle of the gun. This is obviously where the feed uh, happens in the bottom or where the empty brass cases fall out and over on this side which you can't see at the moment is where the belt is fed. We have a carrying handle, very reminiscent of the Bren gun, it must be admitted. And also there's a catch here. This catch is pulled back, the barrel is twisted, and then disengages for changing. On this part here, again it's on the side facing me, and we'll have a look at that in a moment, is a, uh, could be described as a depression. And this is where it marries up with a pinch bolt for when it's being mounted uh, on a sustainable uh, mount or again on the Hotchkiss and we'll be looking at that in a moment. Let's move forward slightly. You will notice if you do look on the internet at various pictures of these in service that they sometimes appear to have a thicker or longer barrel than what we've actually got here. You'd be quite right. 
What we've actually got here is a later barrel. So this is the 7.62, so you will notice a little bit thinner. Also, it comes with its own perforated flash eliminator at the end. On the front here, we have a bipod. And in the overall design of the AA52, this particular element, I think, could have done with some improvement. It's a very basic uh, uh, design, and it's extremely flexible, able to move around, but also forward and backward. To secure this bipod, the bipod is snapped together, brought up against the barrel, and then we have a, well, spring-loaded attachment that goes across the top and holds it below the barrel like so. As you can imagine, this is quite an older gun, so these springs tend to stretch, and then we get an incredible amount of movement with the bipod at the bottom of the gun. Therefore, when we look at these, this mounted on a vehicle, you will notice the bipod will magically disappear, and that was common practice inside the French Army to actually remove uh, the bipod. The weapon fires what were described as a linked uh, set of ammunition, the links are quite interesting. They are uh, singular pieces that actually link together, which enables them to come apart once they pass through the gun. As we can see here, they are very, very simply linked together. And really, to help us out, it has AA52 uh, written on them, so we can't mix them up with anything else. And this, again, looks very reminiscent of the German MG uh, uh, machine gun links. As I mentioned a moment ago, the weapon went through two incarnations, the first one being the 7.5 millimeter, so we have a 7.5 millimeter round here, and then it was later upgraded to the 7.62. The first thing you will notice <clears throat> is that the two brass rounds are incredibly similar, but as you can see, the 7.5 is just marginally longer. So how do we keep this chain together? The chain is linked, and then using one of the rounds, it slides from below up into the clip and thereby creating its integrity. We have here, and this is the MAT-49. This is a submachine gun. As you can see, it was made from pressed steel and welded, in some cases, uh, quite roughly together. What you will notice is when we compare the two weapons, that there are some similarities. I'm just going to fold the magazine up out of the way. This is getting, you can't see very clearly. So that was one of the features of the Mat 49. I was able to fold the, the magazine out of the way. And what you will notice is the trigger, gut, the trigger uh, mechanism and certainly the rear part of the gun uh, look very similar. And that is because they work in the same way. This is a blowback weapon. You can see there's no uh, gas mechanism uh, above or below the barrel and simply the cartridge going off push that two-piece bolt to the rear and it's cycled. Very similar to as the uh, MAT-49. Now this will feature in another video uh, but not at this moment so we'll put this one away. What we have here is the FM-24 and this weapon predates the AA-52. So really this was the mainstay of uh, the infantry and mounted on vehicles before the AA-52 came along. Now this was initially designed, as you guess, in 1924. The French very helpfully always put the year in the name of their guns, which interestingly this was also used in the Second World War and right through to the 1950s just disappearing after the, uh, uh, in Algeria in the mid-60s. Okay, but this isn't a video about the particular gun. What I'm trying to do here is to draw your attention to the precursor to the AA-52, and you can see that it's much heavier, it's obviously magazine-fed, but it did copy a few things in the design of the AA-52 from this weapon. Number one was the use of a rear monopod at the back, and even indeed the front bipod. This is a bipod as used on the AA-52, but you will see that it is incidentally exactly the same as we was used on uh, the FM. So that was just to show you how the weapons in the French Army had developed from this to the belt-fed machine gun. We will also be mounting this in a while on the Hotchkiss M201 to show you how these were uh, used in vehicles. Okay, so now what we're going to look at is the sustained fire setup for that AA-52 that we've just gone through. And it all starts with this, down here. 
This here is the Browning model 1919 tripod. This was used by the Americans throughout the Second World War, and at the end of the war, the French had, well, one would describe a large amount of surplus American weapons, including this tripod. This particular one's from 1951, I think it's Greek, but that's uh, neither here nor there because it's just uh, basically the same design. So, how do we get the AA-52 onto this? This weapon, when it was mounting the Browning, would have used this, a normal pin tool. And that does quite simply sit snugly in the top of the tripod. As we looked on the, uh, the machine gun that we're dealing with here, there really isn't an area to attach uh, the bottom of the gun to this. And so the French came up with what can be described as a conversion plate. This conversion plate really sits upon this tripod and this pin tool. And you will see here that there is a pinch bolt activated by this lever, and we're going to need that to, to uh, attach the AA to the top of it. Also, you'll notice there's this weird sort of D-shaped piece of uh, bar here. This is to keep the incoming rounds on the belt. As the, uh, the incoming rounds come up on the belt, so therefore this stops sta snagging on the rest of the gun. The attachment of this to the pin tool if you want to come on in, it's quite straightforward. I'm just going to put this down here. So the pin tool has a retaining bolt, which I've taken out. The converter plate fits in the top of the pin tool. It is slightly tricky to line up. You put the bolt back in, he says. And then the nut on the back. So now this is set up, we've got a great amount of play in this plate, but what we don't have is control over the elevation. So therefore, let's bring out, and probably recognisable to quite a few people, here again we have the American elevation device for the use on this tripod. To fit this, again, quite simple, we make sure that the hook is facing inwards because obviously we have settings along the back. You need to see when you're behind the weapon. So this clips over here and the converter comes back down on. Okay. I think we'll just pop that on so it doesn't go anywhere. So now we have the elevation, but obviously the movement of the gun is slightly restricted to a smaller arc of fire. We are now going to fit the AA-52 to this setup. I'm bringing the weapon across, and what I will point out, because we were unable to show you in that other video, because we we're looking at the other side of the gun, we now have this dimple here, and this dimple needs to align with a plunger in this conversion plate to pinch it. Also, you will notice that there is a slot here in the front of the trigger mechanism, and that will fit into the back of this converter plate. So here we go, gun slides in, the barrel, once this is open, <laughs> drops down, and then aligned, he says, aligned, there we are, and then pressing down hard to lock the weapon in position. And now we have the weapon in the sustained fire mode. There's just one final thing to show you, and that is the loading of the belt into the gun. So we have here a belt of ammunition. You will notice at the very end is this, well, feeder tab with a finger hole here. The rounds can be loaded by lifting the top cover, but for expediency, what we, there was this design in which we are able to feed this tab into the top cover. Now this will take, I'm doing it back to front, so this will take a second. We grab it on the other side, I put my finger in, and then simply pull. The first round is now engaged. It's ready for us to either ease the springs forward or cock the weapon. That will put the round into the chamber, and off we go. Now some of these weapons, we did have an ammunition box mounted on the side. We do have that set up on our other gun, and we'll be looking at that 
as it's fixed to the side of the Hotchkiss Jeep. You may ask, or may observe, that this isn't a great way of letting your rounds fall on the floor, or certainly if you're on a vehicle, draping over the side of it. So we need to control these rounds in some way. So if we didn't have the ammunition box and the ammunition box mounting plate, the French were extremely practical and they designed this. It's just a simple canvas bag that attaches to the side of the weapon and the rounds fall into it as such. If this gun was mounted, say, inside of an armoured vehicle or a tank, there would also be a canvas bag that sits on the bottom here that would catch the expended rounds to stop them bouncing around and going down the back of the shirts of the drivers. This is the AA-52 now mounted on the Model 53 French Army machine gun mount. We have the, uh, the post here, very similar to the World War II American design, and that's quite securely attached uh, by plates on the inside to this particular Jeep. If you have a Hotchkiss M201, and you've always noticed a hole down here in this small step, and you have a pair of corresponding holes here, there's a high likelihood that at one point in the past, your Jeep was mounted with this configuration. At the top of the post, we have a pinch bolt. This is to stop it moving in transit. And then we have what is described as the swan neck. This is a one-piece cast metal arm, uh, described in French as the bras, the arm. And then in the top, we have here the pintle mount. For those of you very observant uh, watching, you will notice that now we don't have the front bipod, we've removed that, but also we've removed the front sight. I've only just noticed that as we started filming, so use your imagination, there should be a sight here. Also, you will notice there is a lack of the rear sighting, and it's slightly different in the rear. The reason for that is this weapon is out of an armoured car. So we've taken this out to put it into this to enable us to do the filming. So, the gun standard, no other changes apart from that. You may frequently see the larger barrel because it can, well, take more rounds, able to dissipate the heat. So let's just have a look at the dexterity of this. It's quite an easy movement outwards, easy movement forward. The gun can move quite freely. But there are some observations to be had around this. Number one is you cannot really use this weapon whilst the windscreen is in the up position. If you do, then the ammunition box has a tendency to collide with it and also possibly the barrel. I'm going to jump in now and show you how flexible it is for the passenger. These weapons were mounted at various points on this vehicle. Not this actual one, but the Hotchkiss Jeep. You could have this side mounting, which is for the passenger. There was also a rear mount for the uh, uh, firing out the back of the vehicle. And there was also quite rare pictures of these mounted immediately behind the driver or the passenger. In fact, the only place I don't think they mounted these, very often at least, is on a post behind or between the driver and the passenger, as you may have seen on some of the American Jeeps. Okay, so let's just have a look at the, the flexibility or dexterity of this arm and with the gun for a passenger. So we have to imagine we're actually travelling along. Um, I'm to grab the weapon. The first thing you'll notice is the weapon, unless these bolts are using pinch bolts, and these aren't, these are the quick release mechanisms, the gun is very free to float around. So therefore, if I wasn't holding uh, the weapon or it wasn't close to me, there is a chance in an off-road position that this gun will move. Not great. So I'm grasping the weapon, I'm bringing it up, and I now need to bring that into my shoulder for effective fire. The first thing you notice again is I'm actually leaning out of the vehicle quite a bit here, so if we're in an off-road position, it's quite precarious. Otherwise, I have to lean quite forward, which is great, 
and for me to rotate the gun across to the other side, there's quite a, 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 quite a movement, a bit of flexibility you have to have in your spine there to do that. The one thing I've noticed by doing this as well is having this ammunition box on the side of the gun, when the gun is highly elevated, the box actually collides with this swan neck, so therefore you lose the left and right movement. So on the haul, great that it's at hand, especially for the passenger. Use of the gun in movement while the vehicle's moving along, not so great to be honest, but let's be honest, a nice looking accessory to have on the side of your Hotchkiss. So we've just explored the pros and the cons of having this mounted on the side of the Jeep, especially in the configuration that's using the ammunition box. So what we're going to try now is we're going to try and put the sustained fire configuration on here to see if that's any better. So bear with me as I uh, fiddle with some of these bolts and catches and we'll see how easy it is to do. So I'm going to remove the spring. Oh, is a heavy piece of kit. We'll move that out of the way. And here we have the sustained fire. Okay, wasn't that difficult at all, was it? So now I think we have a more stable setup. As you notice, it actually holds itself against the swan arm. The gun is now pivoting uh, a little bit further forward, so this is closer into the shoulder of the passenger. And the one thing left to do is to actually put the ammunition belt in. To be able to mount the FM, we actually need to remove out of here a collet. So therefore we can put a slightly different pintle in. So I'm going to remove this swan neck. That's done by undoing a bolt here at the rear, loosening off the pinch, and with some persuasion, the arm's able to come off. What you can see here on the camera is this collet for different pintles to sit into. So I'm just gonna move that to one side. Here, we have one we prepared earlier. This has no collet, so this can actually take quite a larger circumference pintle. This mounts back down into the hole. Make sure you tighten up the, the, the bolts at the back. And now we have a pintle mounting for the FM. This is a larger circumference here on the bottom, so that fits smoothly inside. I'm now going to bring the gun over. Here we have the 24. And you will note that the ejection port is on the right, so unlike uh, the Bren gun, which this looks very similar to, there is no ejection port on the bottom of the gun. Instead it has a handle, rather like the bar 1918, and inside of that handle is a receiving hole that allows the weapon to be mounted. So that's it. Thanks very much for watching. I'm just going to have uh, a cup of tea a second. So, cheers to you. Uh, not a great cup of tea, I must be honest. Ollie, the cameraman, I think has played another joke on me. Let's see what it says this time. Same message. Please subscribe and we can make more of this content. Thank you and goodbye.